Welcome back to Red Ice Radio. Thank you for tuning in, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Henrik from Sweden, and this is independent online talk radio that covers an uh, extraordinary amount of different topics. We follow different threads at different times, so you're uh, not going to get the same thing all the time. We indeed like to explore different avenues. And if you check our archives on RedIceCreations.com and RedIceMembers.com, I'm sure you'll see what I mean. We come to you three times per week with uh, one of these shows being Radio 314 with Lana, usually every other week. Our uh, mission, if you want to call it that, is to continue to search for answers. We want to ask the right questions. We want to have accuracy in history. We want to analyze conspiracies and see through the lies as we navigate the information ocean with uh, both an open mind, but also using our critical ability. Today we're talking with David Talbot, who's back on the program, a comparative mythologist whose work offers a new radical vantage point on the origin of ancient cultural themes and symbols. His research has been the primary catalyst behind the Saturn model and is the subject of many documentaries like Remembering the End of the World and Symbols of an Alien Sky. He is author of The Saturn Myth and co-author with Wallace Thornhill of Thunderbolts of the Gods and the Electric Universe. Today we're going to talk more about the Thunderbolts project, the Electric Universe, Electric Comets, the Saturn model, and ancient memories from our prehistory. Welcome back, Dave Talbot. Uh, excellent to talk with you again. Hope you've been uh, well. It was uh, over a year ago, I think, since we last spoke. So great having you back. Thank you for coming on again. Oh, very nice to be here, Henrik. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. And I, I have very fond memories of our uh, earlier uh, conversation because it it actually brought a lot of people to our conference and they all made a point of saying, I'm here because of Henrik. Wow, that's great. Excellent. Well, I hope we can do the same today then because we're going to oh, obviously talk about the new upcoming conference here in March uh, a little bit later and get into some of the yeah. details about that. You know, it's a, it's a great lineup this year and a lot of, uh, you know, new and exciting people and, and of course a lot of the returning greats, greats as well, if you will. But Let's not assume that everyone has heard our, you know, archive shows that we've done with you, Dave and, and Wallace and some of the other people. Tell us just a little bit about the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts project to, to potential newcomers. Very good. Uh, the Thunderbolts project is uh, right now my life's activity and it, it uh, bills itself as uh, the Internet uh, voice for the Electric Universe. Uh, that's the Thunderbolts project at the website thunderbolts.info. And uh, there would be no Thunderbolts project were it not for a convergence between my own life's work and that of Walt Thornhill, an Australian physicist who gave the electric universe its name today. And uh, I had the pleasure of meeting Wall in the 90s, 94 and then at 96. And uh, because I had been concentrating on uh, ancient symbolism, the roots of uh, ancient mythology in catastrophic events, celestial events that would just be off the grid of modern uh, scientific theory. Uh, Wall got interested in that and he, in 1996, in early 1997, he spent 30 days in my office actually showing me that these extraordinary configurations in the sky that I had reconstructed from the points of agreement of the ancient cultures using no other source of evidence than that underlying convergence between cultures around the world relating to things seen in ancient times and not seen today. And Wal Thornhill convinced me that those formations were electric discharge formations in the plasma environment of the ancient earth. And that was the beginning then of a collaboration be between us that uh, has come to be known as the Electric Universe and specifically the Thunderbolts Project. Now, what has happened in recent years is that this project has become a movement. There is an undeniable movement underway now that will never be turned back because it involves thousands of people who are feet on the ground and ha have taken seriously the evidence that has been brought together for decades now uh, that science has not understood the history of our planet, the nature of bodies in space, or the nature of human history itself and the origins of the early civilizations with all of their monumental cultures looking back 
to extraordinary natural events. So that's the electric universe in a nutshell. And I'm, well, I'll be happy to talk about any aspect of this because it is very interdisciplinary and it's very sweeping in its implications. Well, certainly, and and it's it's broad. It's it's I would say it's a holistic, you know, perspective and view one that's not uh, broken up into many different fields, but they do they do connect in a in the most extraordinary way. And uh, so, tell us a little bit where this is leading our understanding of the of the universe, then, David. In contrary to what you know, regular astrophysics is is leading us, if you will. Yes, we use the phrase uh, often uh, gravity centric. That's kind of a defining phrase for the underpinning of modern cosmological theory across interplanetary, interstellar, and intergalactic distances. Only gravity is named as a force that could do any real work. Now, what we're claiming, and claiming on the base, basis of a huge amount of evidence now, Henry, Electric currents flow across the cosmos in the sea of plasma, very diffuse sea of charged particles that make up the, the interstellar and intergalactic medium. The movement of charged particles across vast distances constitutes a huge potential to shape galaxies, to organize uh, stars into these glowing uh, discharging spheres to create planets and on our own planet to profoundly affect the evolution of the surface itself. Electricity has been far more active than the science has recognized and that's uh, beginning at the microscopic uh, level uh, all the way up to the intergalactic level. We live in an electric universe in which at every level of observation, you are observing events that cannot be understood without a larger electrical context. So our Earth cannot be comprehended properly as just an island. Our sun cannot be identified properly as just an island in space dominated by gravity. And our galaxy is profoundly affected by an even larger galactic environment of charged particles. So th and this is evidence-based. In other words, when we look at galaxies in remote space and we observe them uh, across the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we see stupendous energies around these galaxies and particularly along the axes of these galaxies that dwarf the galaxies themselves. That's the dead giveaway that the galaxy has been organized and not just by gravity, but by the electric force as well. That's the electric universe. Indeed, and, and all of this evidence, of course, is there to see around us uh, in our solar system, in, in comets to swoosh by, to Mars, to, to the sun, and all the behavior, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's wrapped into this. But maybe we can talk a little bit about some of the comments. We've had a couple of ones passing by us here since we last spoke, Dave, and, and a couple of, you know, both El and Nien, we have we have Ison, and they all uh, w whimpered away in the sun and everything. Maybe we can just talk about the behavior of comets a little bit. Yeah, well, that's an interesting subject, now, and, and it's a huge subject because in the end, if you really want to understand uh, the nature of comets, you, you have to uh, think electrically. Uh, and an electric comet model uh, envisions comets moving through the electric field of the sun. That means if they're on a more pronounced elliptical orbit, they're going to be under greater electrical stress than any body that is moving around the sun uh, in a more uh, circular orbit. Now, it's more complicated than that, but, but a body plunging into or through the electric field of the sun from the most remote regions of the solar system and if it's, if it's of any appreciable size, it's going to begin discharging electrically, and that is the identity of a comet. But see, science locked onto the idea of comets being dirty snowballs that were actually uh, sublimating in the warmth of the sun, and that, that vision of comets precluded them 
from seeing the connection to the electric field of the sun. So when they would see a comet that would be discharging, let's just say out by, uh, I mean, creating a, a coma or tail, let's say out by Jupiter or beyond, mm -hmm. they have to add up the surface area in that icy cold region to find a way to account for it's having a coma. And they will tend to always overstate the size of the body because it needs that much surface area or you just couldn't see, you wouldn't have something pre presenting that cometary glow out that far. So they've developed this habit of overstating. I mean, you can go all the way back to Comet Kahutek, but we had Comet Elenin and then uh, Comet Ison. They, they, they all fizzled out, yeah. essentially. Yeah. I mean, Comet Elenin, it just exploded into this little cloud of dust. It was nothing like the two or three miles that they had wide that they had originally projected based on its earlier performance out uh, near the orbit of Jupiter. Same thing exactly with Comet Ison. And it, as it moved uh, through the outer atmosphere of the sun, it just completely disappeared. Now, they were expecting if it disappeared, you'd get a, a very visible dust cloud. And there was nothing left. No. These were not miles wide bodies coming in. They were over, the sizes were overstated uh, based on the need of the sublimation model, the dirty snowball model, the, the need for a huge surface area to get that kind of a display. Does that make sense, incidentally? <laughs> yeah, oh, certainly, certainly. And I mean, Eisen was... Um slated to potentially become one of the you know comets right. of the century already you know yeah. and just nothing so, it was nothing. so, what, so they, what happened they couldn't, even see, they couldn't even see a dust cloud after it right and and, and when ellen uh, disintegrated there was a very very diffuse dust cloud and by the way no water no water the, 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 the idea that a comet is holding in its nucleus this reservoir of water. This has just been refuted again and again and again. So something has to give here in our comet theory. It can be a rock moving through the electric field of the sun and, and reaching a certain point of stress where discharging occurs to the surface and you begin to develop a, a cloud around that nucleus and then uh, a comet-like tail as it's interacting with the electric field and the solar wind. So comets are one of the great windows to the electric universe. You can't have an electric comet unless the body is moving through the electric field of the sun. Well, an electric field of the sun, is, it, it, it is almost absent entirely from the lexicon of solar physics today. But if you allow that a comet is actually discharging electrically, that will imply an electric field across the whole heliosphere, the domain of the sun, out to the heliospheric boundary, an electric field powerful enough to actually light the sun itself. So the electric comet takes you by uh, logical reasoning to the hypothesis of the electric sun which is a major centerpiece of the electric universe view of the cosmos. Indeed. Now, and, and of course, we can go there in order to explain some of this, but I wanted to ask you then um, how we separate some of the behavior or, or, or effect, if you will, that we saw what happened to, to the two comets that we mentioned, talked about in their fate, as opposed to something like uh, Comet Holmes, for example, who completely last time was around in 2007 really blew yeah. up and it became this huge object, you know, that uh, with a, with a you know a blue tail and everything. So what why why this big difference between the behavior? Well, I, I think Comet Holmes probably was a more substantial body, uh, and uh, and in the electrical environment of the sun, there are going to be things that have to be looked at very carefully if the comet is an electrical phenomena, an event can transpire which will break down the capacitor-like layer at, of the surface. See, if it's electrical, it's moving through the, a positively charged 
uh, region of the sun and beginning to discharge, but it's acquiring a, a surface charge as a result of the protons from the sun gathering on that surface. This creates a capacitor-like uh, layer on that cometary nucleus. If an outburst from the sun then uh, reaches that uh, cometary surface, it can provoke a capacitor-like breakdown. Now, that is what apparently occurred with Holmes because it was preceded by a tremendous spike in the, the solar activity. I mean, just over hours, there was a huge increase. Uh, it shows up in the, the records of solar activity as a spike. And when that reached Comet Holmes, the, the, the comet responded. It wasn't responding to the temperatures of the sun. It was moving away from the sun. But uh, it produced a huge breakdown electrically. And it's like that coma grew a million fold uh, in the span of days, actually. Yep. And, and the comet disintegrated. People may not all realize that. That, but uh, later, as they analyzed uh, I images, high-resolution images and very sophisticated analysis, they were able to determine that the comet had, had literally broken apart. And that's not something that heating will do to a dirty snowball. A, a, a breakdown of that sort is an a more energetic uh, occurrence, and Comet Holmes showed that in spades. Charge particles from the sun affecting the surface of a comet was never part of comet theory, but it is an inescapable part of comet theory, or should be an inescapable um, tenet of comet theory today. Now, tell us a little bit more about the electric sun, some of the, some of the components, and, and of course, everyone always tries to figure out what what drives the solar cycle the the, the we recently actually had a, a flip of the magnetic field i believe uh, just a yes. few days ago so what what lies behind the mystery of, of the sun david well uh you know in 70 years of solar physics since the beginning of the space age peer reviewed journals never entertained the question uh, as to whether the sun was being affected by an external electrical environment. The question was never asked. The other part, uh, or the accompanying fact here, is that the defining features of the sun are all anomalous. I mean, apart from the fact that you have a, a body that's big and it shines, and it's round, the defining features of the sun do not follow from the thermonuclear fusion model. Try to find a chain of reasoning from a thermonuclear model to the acceleration of the solar wind. I mean, up to hundreds of miles per hour and continuing to accelerate out past the planets. There's nothing in the and that concept of the sun as a thermonuclear island that would ever predict such a thing, even it would ever even allow for such a thing. But it happens. The heating of the corona, a complete mystery, that as you get further from the so-called furnace, the temperatures go up. Around the equator of the sun, there's a, a rapidly circulating torus. should not be there. It's an indication of... A, a force driving circulation from outside the sun. You see that most clearly in the super rotation of the equatorial atmosphere of the sun. It rotates 35 times for every rotation of the circumpolar atmosphere of the sun. A complete mystery. So uh, sunspot behavior, the polar jets of the sun, the e electrical activity that it is being identified now at the heliospheric boundary, which is the interface of the sun's domain with the galactic electrical environment. All of these things are confirming the electrical nature of the sun. And yes, the magnetic field of the sun is very much a part of it, and the flipping of the magnetic field is, an, is a very fascinating mystery, but it's all part of that larger context. I mean, just imagine, if you are 
sending probes all the way out, you know, billions of miles out to the boundary of the, the heliosphere, and you're still seeing that the charged particles are moving a, a, along a, the lines of the magnetic field. You are supposed to believe that a little dust mote at this, I mean, imagine a dust mote in the center of your room there, Henrik, that is supposed to be controlling the behavior of all of the dust particles around it. Right. Uh, that's the magnetic field of the sun imagined as being created at the core of the sun is that little dust mold in relationship to the volume of the heliosphere. Right. And yet the, the magnetic field extends out to that boundary and through the boundary into intergalactic space. And everything that is being discovered there by the Voyager probes and so on that finally reach that boundary, uh, the international uh, 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 interstellar boundary explorer, which is, has mapped the energetic neutral atoms around the heliospheric boundary, they're all pointing to energetic electrical events moving along magnetic field lines centered on the sun. That little dust mode at the center of the sun is not what is producing that incredible magnetic configuration. So it's an electric universe. It's an electric sun. The electric sun transacts electrically with the galactic arm of the Milky Way. Uh, electric currents flow along the galactic arms into the highly energized core of the Milky Way. And that energetic activity at the core will never be uh, explained by the kinds of things that popular theory puts at the core of galaxies, such as black holes and that sort of thing. A black hole is supposed to be this all-consuming core, right. and yet you see these incredibly powerful jets of, uh, with material just exploding out along the axes of these uh, galaxies. And, uh, and these were predicted by the father of plasma science, Hannes Alfang, decades ago as electrical phenomenon. He yep. recognized that currents flow in along the arms of the galaxies to provoke these energetic events at their cores. And the jets are one uh, of the direct effects of that kind of electrical activity. It's very interesting. Uh, it's been around for such a long time, you know, the the, the, the science in itself. And it, and yet, you know, even someone like Alfian was very, you know, he won the an, an Nobel Prize and everything. You know, he was, he was up there and yet... And yet there is a resistance to some of these ideas. You know, we had Birkeland from Norway, for example, you know, lead, yeah. leading on from this as well. So it's it's been out there for a long time and you guys have picked up on this and you've strengthened, you know, everything even even further. Uh, but as you said, we talked a little bit before the, the, the show as well here, David. And, um, you know, you mentioned that a lot of people are coming to the field. A lot of people are, as they're working with it, are also gaining credibility and everything else. So you see this as, as a as a momentum, if you will, something that's growing every day, right? It, it is growing, and it, it, it's quite remarkable that we are uh, uh, beginning to attract now people who are really distinguished in uh, different sciences. And in fact, if you go to uh, thunderbolts.info and to the conference page, uh, EU 2014 conference page, that, that is highlighted on the home page. You just go to uh, the conference page and look at the speakers list. The speakers list is still growing, but you'll see that we've been able to attract a lot of very high caliber people uh, to uh, the electric universe movement. And also there are people that if you follow this movement, you'll get to know and you'll see that their it was through their contribution to the electric universe community and to published materials and at conferences and so on, that they actually gained their own accreditation in the field. Right. In other words, that's one of the uh, distinctive contributions that we can make to uh, the culture of science today is people coming into this movement and paying their dues and convincing well-qualified feet-on-the-ground scientists that there's something 
wrong with a particular specialized approach. These people uh, are gaining a credibility, uh, gaining credibility by their uh, contribution to the electric universe movement. And in fact, that's how Wall has risen to the top of the electric universe uh, community as a whole. He has paid his dues over decades, and he has convinced dozens of very well-trained scientists that we live in an electric universe. And you go down that list and you see many people from many different fields, all the way into the study of the origins of myth and symbolism, that they earned their stripes by their contribution to the electric universe movement. Very good. Now, we're going to talk more about some of the speakers in the conference at, you know, at the end of the first segment here and, and a little bit more yeah. in the second there. But, I mean, I think just on a personal note here, one of the most fascinating aspects to this whole field, if you will, is, is the connection to our prehistory, you know, our, our when we observed the things that we did in our ancient past in the, in the sky and the work that, you know, someone like yourself, what you've done, but also, you know, Eduardo Cardona, who's also actually is going to be a speaker at the conference. And that particular angle, I mean, I, I don't know why <laughs> per se, but I think it's it's <laughs> one of the most fascinating ones that we have. Why don't we just talk about that a little bit and just our the human story, you know, the prehistory. The human story. Now, of course, and this is my own life's work. I just pick up the electric universe, physics and so on by osmosis. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> not my original research. I was drawn into this subject through interest in Emmanuel Velikovsky. I, I suspect most of your listeners will know at least something about who Velikovsky was. I believe his, so, yeah. Worlds in Collision, published in 1950, became a best bestseller. And he himself, uh, he, he moved through some very impressive circles, ranging from Albert Einstein to Dr. Pfeiffer at the Harvard University and, and uh, distinguished figures in, the, in history and geology and so on. Um, I got interested in his book, Worlds in Collision, in 1968, and then really got interested in 1972. And I began publishing with my brother Steve a series of magazine formatted uh, publications, a Ponce magazine, Emmanuel Velikovsky Reconsidered. That was uh, May 1972 that that first of 10 issues was published, and it caused a real um, response globally, actually. I mean, we were the number one bestseller on more than one college campuses, campus for a time. And, uh, and it provoked a huge uh, response internationally, but it drew me into the subject. Velikovsky had said Venus was a comet in ancient times. The planet Venus was a spectacular comet that produced on Earth huge catastrophe, civilization-ending catastrophe. And Velikovsky also had in uh, unpublished material a story about the planet Saturn. It, it was planned originally as a segment of his book, Worlds in Collision, and then he removed it uh, to, de to develop it more completely, but I had a chance to see this incredible story in outline form from Velikovsky himself of the story of the planet Saturn in the earliest remembered time. And he noticed that Saturn dominated the earliest levels of human consciousness, human civilization, human storytelling. And why would that be? He noticed a confusion between the, between the planet Saturn and the words for sun, a complete complete mystery. But he had this idea of a golden age of Saturn that was a real phase of real planetary history with the Earth and Saturn somehow linked. Not He didn't try to resolve that, but Saturn appearing as the dominant power in the sky. So I, I could not let that possibility go. In 1972, I started my research on that subject. And I was for years just driven by adrenaline, pursuing <laughs> that. And uh, 
after just the, fir the first few months, I began to realize that the ancient records are filled with images of something in the sky that can be identified by the points of agreement between the different cultures, an actual configuration of something that was associated with a towering figure in the sky that was identified astronomically as the planet Saturn. And that was just the beginning. But within a couple of years, I had put together enough of a reconstruction based entirely on the mythic archetypes, the, the actual accord between uh, the different cultures at levels of very concrete detail, it was uh, persuasive enough to the senior editor of Doubleday, which was the, the largest uh, publisher in the world at the time, that they actually advanced to me what the senior editor, Walter Bradbury, told me was the biggest advance they'd ever given to an unpublished author. There and you that's go. <laughs> I was able to complete the book, The Saturn Myth, two or three years later, it yep. was an incredible chore. Now, the Saturn myth was actually a flop by any commercial standard. But the interesting thing, Henrik, is that there were people out there who got it. They, they could actually follow this monotonous presentation of evidence and see that if this occurred, it's the most important thing we need to know about our own ancient history with yep. implications for the sciences and everything else. So, I mean, here was Ev Cochran. He was just a graduate student at Iowa State. He couldn't put that down. He carried it around, uh, that book around, uh, calling it his Bible. And then he called me, and we developed a really uh, close relationship because I could see that Ev Cochran was not going to let this go. And he was going to, he was going to become a key contributor to this research. And that's exactly what has happened. He's, he's taken the key components of this reconstruction and he's carried it right into the different cultures from Egypt to Mesopotamia to Mesoamerica. And he just, he just takes a fundamental prediction of the theory in this context or in this sense and so on. And he shows that right down to the gnat's eyebrow, that is exactly what the cultures confirm. Where there's no, there, there's no accounting for that level of accord by accident. The predictive value of this reconstruction is very testable. Now, I'm hoping when I say this that people will understand the point that this work has reconstructed extremely concrete formations seen in the ancient sky, where three-dimensional perception is very critical to understanding what was seen. Mm -hmm. The bodies, bodies in the sky moved into different positions. Three-dimensional perspective becomes very demanding. There was electrical discharge going on. The, the appearance of that configuration is reconstructed by highly concrete images recorded around the world. And the movements of these bodies, the development of the electric discharge configurations that were central to its evolution, they all constitute highly specific predictions. Because what was happening on Earth was Human imagination responding to these forms in the sky was exploding with imaginative images. Now, this means that a concrete form in the sky was provoking a wide variety of mythological interpretations. And specific sequences of events were similarly provoking a wide variety of mythical interpretations. But if you look through the symbol to the concrete form expressed, you arrive at an inescapable conclusion. And that is different symbols and different mythical sequences re uh, referring to exactly the same thing. And that becomes the predictive power of a model. You can see what the model is claiming. You can go back and look at the different mythical images and see the identities that are required by this reconstruction. They're very specific, and you can, you can test the reconstruction one component at a time. And people like Ev Cochran have done that. He's, I, I believe that he's emerged as the, 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 the first and foremost contributor to uh, detailed uh, testing of this hypothesis.
And he would be the first to say that it always meets the test, always, at a level of specificity that is unthinkable apart from the actual history of these events. Now, so Ev detailed and, and started to work on some of this after he, he, you know, he came across some of your work and did. Yeah, he, he found the Saturn myth. He and I talked a lot. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he, he followed the evolution of the uh, reconstruction in, in detail. And he always wanted to know. And every time there would be a new dimension added <laughs> to the, the reconstruction, keep in mind, this went on for years, he would say, well, I get that. And then he would take it right into Mesoamerican culture and see if the identifications that are inescapable from this reconstruction are actually there. I mean, it's preposterous yeah. to think that they would be there, but they are there. Yeah. So that's that's how somebody like Ev became utterly convinced that, you know, stake your life on it level of confidence. <laughs> he, just, he just knew you can't meet the test of predictive ability at this level of detail with a false hypothesis. Right. Does that make sense? <laughs> no, Certainly. Oh, yeah. Sometimes this mythological stuff, people hear it's about myth and it's about symbolism. They're not realizing that this is all highly concrete. And beneath all the myths, there are these very concrete formations that are implied. And they are agreeing with each other globally, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in their fit. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating to me this this very concept, and it uh, every time I, I I read about it and listen to it and hear about it, it it evokes something deep in the in the core of me, you know. And and it's it's I don't oh, know, it's just it's so yeah. fascinating, you know. I hear that all the time, Henry. Yeah. And by the way, I, if you don't mind a little self serving note here, very quickly, symbols of an alien sky. Uh, it's had over two hundred thirty thousand views on YouTube. Two hundred thirty thousand views. And it's getting very good responses. I mean, particularly uh, encouraging responses, given the fact that that history of the ancient sky is so preposterous, so preposterous. And yet it resonates with people when they begin to see that it explains everything. Yeah, yeah. Symbolism, origins of of God, the whole thing that probably sparked uh, mankind to first even pick up, uh, you know, a, a a stone to bash into another and form you know what today has become the alphabet you know there's, there's oh yeah that's a great connection yeah pictographs first then yeah. abstracted into alphabets go back to the beginnings of the language and look at those pictographs and their meanings some of these meanings will relate directly to the animal forms that obviously were part of that foundation of the language but a huge quantity of those early pictographs relate to formations that were clearly cosmic and they have no counterpart in our sky today. I mean, that is just part of this historical reconstruction, this historical argument that says the great mythical archetypes have one thing in common. Not one of them reflects anything happening in nature today, yeah. happening in our sky today. Not a single mythic archetype can find an explanation. Well, how does it occur then that they all fit together to tell one story? It, uh, people won't believe this without getting into this. I mean, just as an example, the relationship between the warrior hero figure, a recognized mythic archetype, and the uh, mother goddess figure. Well, those relationships are absolutely explicit. The mother goddess was presented as a star seen visually in the center of the primeval sun. This overarching power that ruled before the present sun exhibits a star-like form in its center. It, that's global. That star is identified as Venus. Well, how would something so preposterous register around the world? Same with the, the warrior hero figure. Uh, always uh, uh, you find when early astronomers were looking out at the planets, uh, they would name the planet Mars as this great warrior in a, an explicit relationship to the planet Venus. That warrior was born from the center or the womb of that star goddess. And in the imagery of the ancient sun god, you see that dark, reddish sphere in the center of the star goddess. 
and that is called the uh, conjunction or the marriage of the warrior hero and the mother goddess, which is why he always wears the star rays as of the goddess as his crown. Mm. So if you if you go to the reconstruction, the, a presentation of the reconstruction, such as you'll find in Symbols of an Alien Sky, which is just a, a, an, an initial introduction, you'll see that all of these relationships actually do fit a very simple, highly concrete geometry of formations in the sky with a very concrete sequence of events connected to all of those forms and three-dimensional perspective being so demanding on this you just can't move these bodies arbitrarily around and get what you see unless the bodies themselves were up there under the demands of three-dimensional perception presenting this scenario to observers on on earth very good. Now, before we proceed and, and, and talk more about this, uh, Dave, let's, uh, and before we take a break here in a while, let's talk a little bit more about the conference. Then I want to give out some details here. I wanted people to know where to, where to go, when it is, where it is, and all that. I think we can talk about some of the speakers as well. You can e either, you know, pull out some of your favorites or you can mention them all if you will. I think there's 21 lined up at this stage as well. But as you said, there's more coming on all the time, right? So tell us about it. Indeed so, and they're all my favorites. I mean, these people are exceptionally uh, well prepared to give presentations on the different nuances of the electric universe, and that does include this historical material. Uh, F. Cochran will be giving a talk or two there. Dwaru Cardona will be giving a talk. Uh, I'll be giving, I'm giving two long talks that will be well-organized <laughs> presentations of a compelling argument for this spectacular ancient uh, experience. But this is a, a conference that will range from physics to the roots of the ancient experience, ancient myths and, and symbols. So while Thornhill will be giving two extended talks at the conference, uh, Professor Don Scott, the author of uh, The Electric Sky, a book that's getting a great deal of attention and acclaim internationally. He will be uh, uh, speaking on the electric sun and um, specifically the magnetic structure of, uh, of the sun that will explain anomalous details that have never really been even addressed adequately in, uh, uh, among uh, solar physicists. You know, uh, Henrik, an experiment was financed. Uh, up to, it's been financed at, at the level of a million dollars. It's called the Sapphire Experiment. Mm -hmm. Test out the electric sun hypothesis. And uh, people from the Sapphire Experiment will be giving presentations, in, including uh, the project manager, Monty Childs, whom I got to know a couple of years ago. And we, we dreamed and schemed between us to put this project together. He was willing to take it on. And uh, it's caught fire now. Uh, uh, Michael Claridge, PhD, will be uh, speaking on the Sapphire Experiment at the conference. Monty Childs will be speaking on uh, the Sapphire Experiment. I, we have a couple of uh, plasma scientists who come right from the mainstream into this project. At least one of them I'm expecting to be there to talk about, well, what this experiment looks like when you're coming from institute, the institutions of plasma science right into such a radical uh, test of a particular and far-reaching uh, hypothesis. Uh, William Mullen on hieroglyphs in the ancient sky. He's been in, uh, he's a when I got to know him initially, he was the youngest professor of classics in the country. That was years ago. And uh, he has just progressed over years to develop a, a, a huge interest in this whole subject of ancient catastrophe. And I just heard from him recently that he will come in. He wants to talk about Egyptian hieroglyphs as a reflection of this configuration. Oh, in really? Egypt. Interesting. Yeah, and he is an excellent speaker, by the way. Huh. He's the only. He, he was the first speaker I ever saw get a standard standing ovation way way back when. Stephen Crothers, the critic of uh, Big Bang theory and black holes, 
very dynamic, incredibly entertaining uh, speaker, and a brilliant mathematician. And he is he is he is stirring up controversy around the world right now. This is just something you have to look into for yourself. You mm-hmm. can find about him on the internet. One thing about the uh, the nature of the electric universe <laughs> is that the plasma behavior pl- plasma is constituted uh, most fundamentally uh, or defined by you might say uh, free moving charged particles, electrons and protons. They they uh, give plasma its conductivity. So the medium between planets, between stars and galaxies is a plasma and and it is uh, a, an electrically conductive medium which is why currents can electric currents can create structure at all scales of observation in space and there's a fractal like quality to this in other words you can scale up uh, an event in the laboratory in a plasma experiment you can scale it up to the, the size of the Earth and its magnetosphere, but also up to stellar dimensions relating specifically to the configurations that, uh, that, that create or out of which stars are born, the filamentation along the galactic uh, arms where we see these, these stars actually coming into existence. Well, you can, you can model these things out of uh, events you observe in the plasma laboratory. Same thing with galactic structure, spiral galaxies, and this sort of thing. Th- these forms can be produced in the laboratory. So f- the fractal qualities of plasma in space become really fundamental to our understanding of what's going on. And there's a fellow named Jonathan Wolf, PhD. He, uh, he, his uh, last couple hundred talks he's given publicly on on fractals have sold out. Extremely popular. Mm. On a Jonathan Wolf PhD talking about fractals and changing paradigms in science and education. Interesting. And uh, here, Pierre Marie Robitaille. I, this figure has ha- has left a huge impact on cosmology, cha- challenging the cosmic microwave background. Uh, the idea that that cosmic microwave background is a residue of the Big Bang. He's actually shredded that, that idea, and uh, he's, become a, he's become a controversial but very compelling uh, scientist, challenging one of the underpinnings of modern cosmology. Huh. And, and these people, I mean, how many have I named so far? Five, six? Something like that, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you have to go to the... Um, the speaker's page because I just started at the top and worked down. I haven't meant, I haven't specifically cited what F. Cochran will talk about. Well, it, it's going to talk about the fall of Phaeton, uh, the, the Greek myth and its relationship to other global myths. Yeah. Uh, this uh, he, hero figure that comes crashing down in the, the uh, in connection with a uh, global catastrophe. And, um, uh, so I, I, I would just urge people to go to thunderbolts.info uh, and go to the conference page and specifically click on the speakers. And we have more that we'll be announcing. It's, it, it's just a tremendous group of very innovative uh, scientists and historians and comparative mythologists addressing the whole sweep of uh, modern theory and redefining the universe oh indeed we're going to have uh, the links up directly to the conference page there uh, from thunderbolts.info on our website redicecreations.com so everyone who's listening and want to find out more about that can just you know either uh, go directly to to the website or find the link from from ours and there's a lot more names there of course and uh, we can also mention of course that yeah, Lana and I will be dropping by there this year as well. So we're very much looking forward to to seeing some of the conferences hooking up with you guys over there. And it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. So we're looking forward to that very much, Dave. Oh, that's uh, that's fantastic. Well, I can tell you I'm looking forward to meeting you face to face now. Indeed, definitely. <laughs> and, and perhaps your listeners are aware of uh, Ben Davidson and the Suspicious Observers uh, website. Uh, I mean, his... Uh, website has just grown spectacularly over the past year. I think that uh, 
he's getting a couple million views a, a month now uh, of his uh, news stories, and he's uh, he'll be coming in and and uh, addressing issues of global warming, and shall we say the fictions of man-made global warming. I hope that's not going too far out on the limb to mm, not for uh, not for this audience. <laughs> for audience, okay, yeah. You know, one of the interesting things, I, I, I'll just say this much normally, I don't talk about global warming because there's such a, there's such a, a, a pervasive assumption circling around the media and so on that it's all, all settled science. Yep. And, and actually, that's, that is in the process of backfiring on the institutions of science today. The, the very uh, fact that the institutions all lined up behind global, man-made global warming as settled science. Uh, th this is going to be one of the great embarrassments of science, I believe, uh, in the next few years. It's just not withstanding investigation. And what is rising to the top is, well, it was predictable. It's the Earth-Sun electrical connection. Yeah. The sun and its electrical connection to the earth are the overriding forces affecting climate change across the millennia, the overriding force. And uh, people like Ben Davidson coming in can vouch for that and others too. And uh, on this matter of global warming, because it is so uh, sensitive and it's so controversial and people are so hesitant to stand up and speak out in this direction. But I, I'm just telling people now, this is all changing. We have dozens of well-accredited and independently thinking scientists in our group. And I cannot find a single one that would give any credence to the common man-made global warming hypothesis. Right. Yeah. Not a single one. And this is this is inevitably uh, going to uh, produce a, a uh, not just a great embarrassment for the institutionalization of theory, but a warning. Stay away from dogma in the theoretical sciences when it is announced as settled. Yeah. I mean, People announce it as settled because they, they're already unnerved by uh, the critics. Yeah. And that's, that becomes the way they just remove the critics from the discussion. And uh, you can see this all the time as people come on to the scientific media or the popular media to defend the idea that human beings created our weather patterns and so on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> indeed. No, it's a, it's a very good point, and they, they've set that... Uh, you know, authority uh, clear from the beginning so that no one even dares to question it. But uh, as you say, I mean, there's there's so many people out there now d doing that. It's just that they're not being uh, addressed in, in, in the proper way and everything. And they're, they're pointed out as being kooks and everything else, which is, of course, far from, from the truth. But, you know, far it's, from. It's, it's very encouraging that more and more people are, are waking up to that and, and realizing that because it's been going around as a, as a, you know, as an assumption in, uh, among many scientists because they haven't actually looked into it. And they think, of course, it's got to be true, right? <laughs> yeah, this, is a, this is how the strategy worked. Yeah. They first established that this is what the, the, the experts uh, say. And then they took polls and they, uh, th then they cited the recitations back to them from the polls by people I mean, the scientists that they were polling didn't have a clue as to the, the, the factual underpinnings of this position or that position, but they were told that it settled science. So then they, they collectively give to the defenders of this ideology uh, a really powerful weapon. Oh, 97% of all the sci uh, scientists agree that, that global warming is settled science. And that was total nonsense when that announcement was made. I may not have gotten the figures exactly right there. But the, the point is, it was entirely a ruse yeah. uh, to uh, fool scientists into uh, playing the game with them. Indeed, indeed. Now, let's see here, before we uh, take a break here, then I just want to mention again, uh, Electric Universe 2014. Uh, it's called All About Evidence this year. And, of course, uh, we'll have the speakers linked up there as well. 
Now, uh, just want to plug a few more things here before we take a short break. Um, remembering the end of the world, Thunderbolts of the Gods, the Electric Universe. You mentioned Symbols of an Alien Sky. Of course, yeah. uh, the Saturn myth, your book. There's so much material out there that people can dig into. But some of this, if people want to have a primer in this and, and really get a good uh, you know, start into the field, is of course just to go to your YouTube channel and check out some of the free uh, f- movies and films that you guys have there. So mention that to us as well. Yeah, we've tried to make as much available as we can, practically speaking, and and we put out these productions about one one a week or sometimes more, called Space News from the Electric Universe, and uh, Wall Thornhill is the most common uh, interview uh, uh, that is given on these Space News, and so they're all, of course all free, and they come out regularly. And what you get by just staying tuned to these you get a sense that there is a relentless path of discovery in the sciences today. And all of these great discoveries are coming as huge surprises to science. That's a dead giveaway that something was not right in the theoretical uh, underpinnings of of the sciences. And so Wal Thornhill, who's very, uh, very deliberate, very uh, clear spoken, uh, he gives an interpretation of the great surprises, really, uh, from an electrical perspective. And it has, in aggregate, over more than a year now, it's brought millions of people to our uh, our YouTube channel, the Thunderbolts Project YouTube channel. And it makes the point clear that in terms of predictive value, predictive ability, standard theory has already failed completely, just failed completely. The fact that where it is failing, the predictive ability of the electric universe stands up to such an extraordinary degree is the most telling point of all in the modern history of uh, science in its confrontation with the electric universe. All right. Very good. Uh, YouTube.com forward slash Thunderbolts project. We'll have that linked up as well. Very good. Stay with us, Dave. Then we'll be right back with more just after this short break here. Stay with us in the second hour as we continue to talk with David Talbot about the Electric Universe and the Thunderbolts project. We'll talk more about the Saturn configuration, ancient memories from our prehistory, and many other points of agreements in myths from around the world. For example, the stories of the World Mountain. Much more is coming up. To continue to listen, please go to RedIceMembers.com and sign up if you're not already a member and you'll get full access to our archives. We spare you from commercial interruptions, and you can stream or download when it pleases you. But before we proceed, let me uh, give you some names of uh, some of our upcoming guests. Walter Block, Dan Fogler, Rick Falkvinge, Richard Dewhurst, Ben Davidson, Robert Felix, Sophia Smallstorm, and John King. Some great shows coming up, and I urge you to uh, subscribe to our member section so you don't miss out on all our great programs. But uh, we'll be back with more in just a few days. Please tune in again. You can subscribe to our RSS feeds and let our latest programs come directly to you. In the meantime, we say thank you for listening. We'll talk to you right after this break.